So hello, everybody, and welcome to What Do Scientists Do? It's a show where I talk to a different science desk each episode, and they tell us all about what it's like to work in the world of science, technology, engineering, and math. My name is Jessica, and today I'm joined by our very special guest. Could you give us your name and your pronouns, please? Yes, my name is Maria Dabrowski, and my pronouns are she, her, and in Spanish, ella. So, Maria, what kind of science thing do you do? Oh, my goodness. What a question. Okay, I've done many science things in my life. I've worn many different hats. Um, What I do currently is work as an outreach specialist for an organization that works at the intersection of two things. So this organization is called RARE. And they do really cool work with behavior change. So figuring out how we can inspire people to do something or to not do something in the name of the planet, you know, doing things that are better for the planet. And then they also work at conservation and environmentalism. So conservation of different animals, but also conservation of people's jobs. For example, fisher, fishermen, fisher jobs across the world um, and conservation of farming jobs, because it's really important that we have people like farmers and fishers on board with with protecting the planet. So it's a really cool thing. And what I do specifically is I figure out a bunch of different groups that we can contact and make sure that we're getting a lot of different people's voices and perspectives and opinions on different things related to the environment and conservation. Cool. So how did you end up in this job? Well, I have always loved the brain. I've always found it fascinating how people think about things, what people think about, how people feel emotions. And so when I, my gosh, I think my first brain experience was when I was in seventh grade. My parents forced me to do science fair. I was not happy about doing science fair. But then I did an experiment about music and memory. And I remember that In my classes, I had to talk to my teachers and play different music types, so classical, rock, rap, alternative, while my classmates took a short memory test. And then I would see if different kinds of music impacted their memory scores. I don't remember what I discovered. I thought it was really cool. And so I was like, okay, all right, this is cool. The brain is cool. Um, I was very inspired, too, by my mom, who has a Ph.D. in psychology. And so I was like, "Okay, I'm going to study the brain. And I decided to go to college. And while I was in college, I studied cognitive neuroscience, which is a very fancy term that just means so cognitive is like it's 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 cognition. It's how we think. Um, It's it's what we think about. It's how we feel emotions. It's how we have memories. And then neuroscience is a little bit more like, okay, we feel things, we think about things, we experience things. How does that work in the brain? Like what parts of the brain are working? What cells are, are, are doing what kind of tasks? How is everything separated? So it's a lot of both science in like how the brain works, but also psychology. And I did a lot of lab work. I worked in studying Parkinson's disease, which is a pretty tough disease. Um, Some of you may be familiar with it. My grandma had it, which is why I decided to study it. And Parkinson's disease is kind of the breakdown of parts of the brain that make people have, they make people shake and have tremors and then also some memory issues. And I really liked that. I really liked the brain. But I found out that working in a lab was not giving me kind of, it wasn't as exciting to me as I wanted it to be. So then I watched this video of a sea turtle with a straw in its nose and some scientists pulling the straw out of the sea turtle's nose. And I've always loved turtles. I had a pet turtle growing up. And I was like, oh my gosh, I need, I need, to, I need to dedicate my life to turtles. I love turtles so much. And I had a bunch of really cool experiences. I was able to work at a sea turtle conservation place in Costa Rica. I was able to go scuba diving in Belize. And in that moment, I was like, okay, I really like the brain still. Lab work is not for me. Neuroscience in the medical field is not for me. But I'm really interested in how people do either choose to do things for the environment or choose to do things that hurt the environment. 
And what kind of things might motivate or be a barrier for someone to make a different decision? And so after all of that, I decided to go to graduate school at the University of Michigan. And what I studied there was sort of a combination of the brain and the environment. So I studied environmental psychology, which is exactly that. It's psychology, like how we, how and why we do things and, and think about things and feel about things, but as it relates to the environment. And then I also studied conservation with a specific focus on sea turtles. And so the way that I did that was I talked to fishers and specifically fishermen in Ecuador. Um, part of my family's from Ecuador. So I spoke with artisanal fishermen in Ecuador to figure out what behavioral barriers and motivations there were for them to take part in ocean conservation and specifically turtle conservation. So all of this to say, it was a long journey that involved brain and sea turtles and ocean and a lot of me realizing over the course of many years what it was that I was actually really interested in. I love that. Have you found anything out like is there any bit of information or like any research results that you've discovered or figured out yes so the research that i did in graduate school is still ongoing because the pandemic like for researchers across the world um the pandemic kind of messed up research schedules and so we have, there are five coastal provinces in Ecuador, which means there's five big coastal sections of Ecuador. And we have interviewed fishermen in three of those five. And so the results that we have now are a preliminary or, or beginning results from, from those three provinces. And basically, the purpose of this is that, you know, there's lots of rules and laws that say we have to protect sea turtles. But if fishermen aren't interested in necessarily, you know, obeying these laws and participating in these laws, we have to figure out why. What is it that is preventing fishermen from wanting to necessarily, for example, stop catching so much fish? And so the only way we can find out an answer to that or answers to that, because there's probably a lot, is by actually listening and talking to the fishermen. And so that's something that's so important in science is sometimes scientists think they know the answer. And so they go into a community and they say, this is the answer and this is what we must do. But that's, that ends up being wrong for a lot of reasons. And one of the biggest reasons, again, relates to psychology. When you go in and think that you know the answer to something, or if the government or a group goes in and says, we know the answer, you must not do this. And there's so many reasons why fishermen can or don't want to do that. Then nothing ends up happening. It doesn't end up working out well. So. We went into, and when I say we, I worked with a really cool organization called the Leatherback Project. They do a lot of awesome sea turtle work. And then I also worked with a group of local Ecuadorian biologists and university students. And so we went to these different communities and spoke with 120 different fishermen from those three different provinces. And we said, okay, we're here to learn. How is the ocean important to you? How do you want to be involved in protecting the ocean? What do you see as your role? What are some barriers to conservation for you? How do you think the community should act? How do you think the government should act? What are your thoughts about sea turtles? What are your thoughts about sharks and seabirds? Um, what are the biggest differences that you've seen over the course of being a fisherman? And some of these fishermen have been fishing for like 50 years. So they've seen a lot of things. Some fishermen have been fishing for two years. So we wanted to get a really good idea from a bunch of different fishermen from different places of different ages, different backgrounds to see, okay, when we're talking about ocean conservation, what do you think should happen? And so one of the most awesome results was we had a question at the end of the survey that was, would you be interested in working with nonprofits and or the government to come up with a solution that is with your perspectives and your feelings and your ideas in mind with how we can protect the oceans and sea turtles. And so the thing I want to point out here is that my love and motivation is sea turtles. But really early on, I realized that when you are talking about conservation, a lot of times scientists, um, especially scientists in, in certain places, will focus entirely on the animal without also thinking about the people and communities involved in protecting that animal. 
And so what my research did, inspired by, by many, many kinds of research, especially indigenous and so native people's research, is focusing first on the people and realizing that people are really important to protecting animals. So even though I love sea turtles and I want to go protect and save every single sea turtle, I realize that I can't do that and I can't learn about them properly if I don't listen to the people who have much more experience with fishing and sea turtles and ocean than I do. And so the most exciting bit of research is that people are really, and, and fishermen in these communities are really excited to get involved. Another piece of research, another finding that we had, which is a little bit scarier, is that every single fisherman, with maybe the exception of one that we spoke to, said, fishing today is not like fishing 50 years ago. There are no fish. We are worried about not being able to feed our families. We are worried about our communities. Our young people, instead of choosing to fish, are going to find factory jobs away from the coast. And so we have fishermen who are really inspired to act and help protect the ocean and fishermen who are really worried that fishing is no longer going to be something that they can do because there simply are not enough fish left. So those would be kind of the two most interesting and, and emotional pieces of our research findings that we had. That's really interesting. What kinds of things are happening in response to those findings? So our next steps, first we have to finish the research, which is in the works, I promise. And one thing that a lot of scientists will tell you about research and a lot of anybody who does any sort of research will say it takes forever sometimes. So um, one of the, the things that we need to do is actually finish interviewing all of the people. But the next steps, once we have all of our data, is to start talking to people. And so the goal of this research is to bring it to um, different people in the government, like in the environmental portions of the government in Ecuador, and say, listen, this is what the fishermen want. If you are able to talk to the fishermen and um, listen to their, the, look at these data and listen to these results, this is what you can do to actually create laws that fishermen want to follow and that can actually help sea turtles and ecosystems broadly, like coral reefs off of Ecuador, but also deep sea ecosystems off of Ecuador. This is what you can do to actually help those ecosystems rebound and get back to, to being healthy. And so that's the next that's the next big step. So for example, one of the things that I'm going to do to at least start spreading the word about this research is in March of 2023, I will be going to Colombia, um, to Cartagena, which is on the coast of Colombia. And there is the International Sea Turtle Symposium, which is the biggest symposium is sort of a conference. It's a place where a bunch of sea turtle researchers and nerds can get together and talk about sea turtles and science and, and ocean science. So I'm going to go there and present my research and hopefully that presentation will get people talking and get people more excited. And so next steps are sharing our results with the public, sharing the results with the government, continuing to get more of those data points that we need because we need to finish getting every coastal province in Ecuador. So we make sure we have a good sample of people that we've heard from and perspectives that we've listened to and just continuing to talk about it. Eventually, eventually, when I finally get to it, there will be at least one paper that comes out of this, a scientific paper that um, will be published and shared with the research community about our findings. I love that. Have you been to this sea turtle symposium before or will this be your first time? Oh, I'm so excited to say this will be my first time. I'm actually even more excited because um, when I went to Costa Rica, which was my first experience ever doing sea turtle work, um, I learned so much from this couple that I stayed with. Their names are Gabby and Sherry. And Gabby actually used to poach or hunt sea turtles. And then he decided that instead of doing that, he wanted to help conserve and protect sea turtles. So I learned a lot of lessons from him, not only about what it takes to, to sort of change your behavior, which again is what I have studied and what I do with my job, not only about changing your behavior, but about why people do hunt and poach sea turtles and some of the reasons that people don't necessarily think about, like to feed their families and to have enough money to have their kids go to school. And then Sherry um, is, I, I have to say, unfortunately she passed away, um, but she was my biggest inspiration for sea turtle stuff. And she believed 
that I could do sea turtle work before anybody else did, before I even started doing sea turtle work. And so she actually told me about the International Sea Turtle Symposium because she had gone a few times. And so I'm really excited to go this year, not only to present my research, but kind of to go in her in her name and her honor, because, you know, when you find somebody in the science STEM community that inspires you, they're the ones who are your champions and they really motivate you. So for a lot of reasons, I'm really excited. Um, I get to see my friends and my research coworkers um, from my master's project again. Um, and so it'll just be a really lovely time. Yeah, that sounds so sweet and so yeah. lovely. Yeah. And it's probably just the best time to be in a room full of people who are all just really into sea turtles. Exactly. Do you have a favorite science thing that you've ever done? Oh, boy. You know, I love sea turtles. This, okay, so going to going to Columbia could very well become my new favorite science thing. Um, my favorite science thing that I've ever done was two. Let me choose two because I'm indecisive. My top sea turtle science thing that has been my favorite thing that I've ever done um, was scuba diving. And, and it wasn't necessarily for science, but of course I wrote down every single, you know, science doesn't always have to be formal, right? And so when I went scuba diving, I took a, a cheap little underwater camera with me and I took photos of every single thing that I saw, every fish, every coral, every animal, every shark, and everyone at the time, and, and so the point of all that was so that I could identify it. And I bought a book w- to identify all the species I saw and teach myself. Because a lot of times science is teaching yourself. You don't have to take a class in it. You don't have to, to get a degree in it. You can just teach yourself. And everyone on that boat, and for the whole week that I was there, said, you're not going to see any sea turtles. Unfortunately, all the sea turtles have been scared out of the area because people keep chasing them and trying to touch them. But then, one day, we were diving. And all of a sudden, the dive instructor pointed out to me a sea turtle, and it was a hawksbill sea turtle, and they're critically endangered, which means that there are not many left in the world. And to see this sea turtle who had no, you know, fishing lines around them, who had no um, damage to their shell, nothing. It was just a, a beautiful sea turtle swimming in a pretty healthy coral reef. There were fish bothering the sea turtle, and the sea turtle, sea turtle kept ducking their head away to avoid the fish. And everyone else who saw the turtle was keeping a respectful distance. And so that was the coolest thing ever. But on the same trip, and this is, again, where, where science can just be so cool, um, we were at the end of the dive in the water. There was a bunch of um, stingrays and um, nurse sharks around the boat because they're used to crowding around boats because they think fishermen are going to feed them. So, so we were just in the water watching them. All of a sudden, this beautiful, ginormous spotted eagle ray, which is like a huge ray. It, it's not as big as a manta ray, which a lot of people know what those are, the huge ones, but it's a huge, it's a huge um, ray that has really cool like leopard cheetah prints all over it. So it's gray with white dots. And it flew, it flew, oh my gosh, it swam beneath, it looks like it's flying, but it swam beneath the dive boat and I got a few photos of it. And I posted it on my Instagram page because I I have a science communication Instagram page where I talk about oceans and birds because I also love birds and all that stuff. And a group of scientists who work in Mexico saw my Instagram post and they reached out to me and they said, hey, we have a database where we take a bunch of photos of spotted eagle rays to identify them because each spotted eagle ray has a different series of prints, just like our fingerprints are all different. They're dots and polka dots and all that kind of stuff is different. And so they said, can we please use your photo in our database? And as a result, we'd love for you to name the spotted eagle ray, because this is the first one that we've seen from Belize. Normally we see them in Mexico, but not really Belize. It was the first or second. And um, so I was, of course, please, this is helping science. This is an example of citizen science or community science where people who are not necessarily studying the animal or the ecosystem can still contribute to science. And um, I named the spotted eagle ray after my cat, whose name is Paco. And um, it was awesome. And so I was, I have a spotted eagle ray that I was able to name just because I was scuba diving and posted a photo on Instagram. So that's probably one of the cooler science things that have happened to me too. That's so cool. So if somebody else comes across Paco 
um, the spotted eagle ray, <laughs> then you would be able to figure out that it was that exactly. same ray. Exactly. And so they can do, you know, they can monitor and say, okay, this pack of the, the spotted eagle ray seems to be hanging around in Belize. Oh, now we see the same spotted eagle ray up in Mexico. I wonder where it's going to journey to next. I wonder if it's looking for a mate or a place to eat better food. And so then using that information and being able to identify that specific spotted eagle ray means that the scientists now have a database where they can keep track of different individuals and figure out their population trends, figure out if the populations are getting bigger or smaller, or figure out if there needs to be any conservation measures put in place to protect the species. And so it's it's really cool that one photo that I took of a beautiful spotted eagle ray in the moment that it swam underneath the boat is able to contribute to science. And a, an easy way for anybody to get involved in that is through birds. Um, there's lots of citizen science and community science things for birds and almost everybody, if not everybody in the world, lives around birds, whether that's a pigeon, which I think pigeons are cool, or or cooler birds, you know. Um, but everyone can get involved with citizen community science, um, especially around birds, if that's, you know, if you don't live on the ocean. Yeah, that's cool. Um, we actually, we talked to Julia Bach, who researches Arctic birds before. Yeah. And we, I talked to her right around Christmas time. So we were talking about the Christmas bird count and bird citizen science. So this is a very good tie in. Um, I will say that. So I'm joining you from Halifax, Nova Scotia in Canada, which is by the ocean. And lots of our listeners might live near the ocean, but it's not as warm. So it's not as easy to scuba dive. Um, but I will, maybe I'll link this in the bio. Have you ever used iNaturalist before? Have I ever? Do I go on iNaturalist every single day? Yes, I do. Um, I might link that because that's a fun way to do citizen science. So you yes. can just take pictures of things and um, other people who might be experts can like verify your pictures and identify species. And it can help scientists figure out like what types of, it can be birds, it can be plants, it can be any type of animal in an area. So we use them at Supernova summer camps, and I know that Dalhousie uses them and uses it in undergrad, like bio courses and yes. stuff. So um, that might be a fun thing to link. Oh it's my, my gosh. it's my favorite thing to just run around and <laughs> yeah. use as well. Yeah, that's such yeah, it's such an easy way to start doing citizen science, and you can literally you know go out of your home and take a photo of a grass any grass or a clover or anything that you see and it'll tell you exactly what you're looking at it's so much fun it's like it's like I don't know Pokemon you get to collect all the different cool things that you see but but it's science mm -hmm. and you can browse it and see if someone else saw a whale somewhere and yeah like, exactly yeah. in fact when I go on trips sometimes and I want to go hiking I will look at iNaturalist and see what's been seen in the areas that I'm going to and then decide okay, well, this looks like it has a good chance of me seeing this kind of bird. Maybe I'll go on this path instead of that one. And so it's a really cool tool. Do you have any advice for anybody who might be interested in a job related to the environment and people in the environment, that kind yeah. of stuff? Yeah. So I think that there are a couple of things. So the first thing that I would say is, you know, a lot of people think when you have to, or if you want to study sea turtles, you have to do marine biology. I've, I want to take a marine biology course eventually in my life, but I've never taken a marine biology course. And I've still worked with sea turtles. And I have still worked with a really cool organization who works with sea turtles. And with my work in, in Ecuador, I got to go scuba diving and see sea turtles. I got to go to a couple really, really cool sea turtle rehabilitation centers um, and, and learn from the scientists there. And so working with sea turtles doesn't necessarily mean you have to get a degree in marine biology. Well, my point here is, you know, there are so many ways to get to the end point. If the end point is you love sea turtles and you want to study them, there are so many ways to get there. And so you can do pretty much whatever you want and still end up working with sea turtles. So if you love art and you're like, oh, science is kind of tricky for me and I'm not so sure that I want to do a science path, but you love art, photography, 
photojournalism is super, super important in getting people to care about and learn about sea turtles, um, as is any kind of art medium, super, super important. If you really, really like math and you're like, I don't know if I want to be in the water with sea turtles, but I still like them and I really love math. There is so much math that can be involved in sea turtle work in figuring out different statistics or different models or figuring out the probability that this sea turtle will go to this place. If you really love engineering, um, you can design satellite trackers for sea turtles that can last longer than the current amount of time that they last. If you really like policy and you want to go into policy or law, you can become an environmental lawyer or go into environmental politics and create um, different laws and rules and, and regulations to protect sea turtles. There are so many different ways. I love psychology. I love the brain. I love communication. And I still got to sea turtles. And so the point here is that there's a lot to be said for being creative and how you get to your goal. And when you hear people say, oh, if you want to study this, you must do this. I would disagree. And I would encourage everybody who's listening in whatever you want to study to think about the creative ways you can get there. Because in, in today, especially, everyone's getting more creative. We have people who are realizing, oh, my gosh, conservation of sea turtles. We can't just have marine biologists. We also need psychologists. We also need photographers. We also need people who are designing satellite trackers. And so be creative and, and stick to what you actually really enjoy doing. Because if you try to force yourself to do something that you're not a thousand percent passionate about just to get to something that you are passionate about, you might burn out. You might not actually end up doing what you want to do. So creativity and being really thoughtful and creative in how you get to your end goal is super important. Also, okay, if you don't have an end goal right now, just to, to be clear, I did not have an end goal when I started my college. I didn't, my end goal was not sea turtles. And then the second thing that I would say that's really important in whatever you do. So I know a lot about sea turtles. Um, that's because I've read a lot about sea turtles and watched a lot of videos about sea turtles. I have never taken a sea turtle class. I don't even, I don't know if those even exist. I have never specifically studied sea turtle anatomy in, in a university or in high school or anything like that. I've taught myself a lot. And sometimes if you really like something and you may not have the resources or the time or the ability to learn it in the typical way, which is maybe a more formal school way, you can still teach yourself. And I think that sometimes um, we think that we need to learn everything in school, but that's not true. If you really are passionate about something, read read books about it, read articles about it. If you are of the appropriate age, go on YouTube and look up videos about it. Teach yourself and never let your creativity and your, your um, passion and your curiosity go away. Because if there's one thing that I can say ties in almost every successful scientist and person I've ever met is curiosity and continuing to be curious. Sometimes people think when you're an adult, you shouldn't be curious anymore. I disagree with that. The more I, the older I get, the more curious I get and the more I'm like, oh my gosh, another book about sea turtles? Yes, please. So I would say be creative in how you get to your end goal and never let your curiosity fade away. And don't be afraid to teach yourself about the things that you're passionate about. So that would, those, that would be my, my two pieces of advice for anybody who's confused about next steps. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining me today, Maria. Do you have anything that you would like to promote? Yeah, um, sure. If you are of the appropriate age, you can go on Instagram and look up at go green for the ocean, which is my handle. And that's my science communication page. Um, if you're curious, I didn't really talk much about my job at Rare, but if you're curious about rare and if you're listening and you're like wow conservation and oceans and behavior change and psychology that sounds super cool you can go to rare.org which is um our website and a, a super cool resource otherwise yeah no i would just encourage I'll, I'll plug that you continue learning about turtles and birds and and anything else that gets you excited about this planet amazing yeah and i will link both of those in the episode description as well well, thank you so much for joining me today, Maria. It was a thank pleasure. Thank you. This was wonderful. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. And as always, a big, big thank you to everybody listening. Do you have a question that you'd like answered by an expert? 
send us an email or a voice recording at what do scientists do at superstaff.ca. For more science fun, you can also follow us on social media at scientistsdopod on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you next episode. Bye for now! This podcast was made by Supernova at Dalhousie University, a network member of Actua. For more information on our summer camps, workshops, and more, check out supernova.dal.ca.